Hi friends, I hope that you are doing well. It is uh, Wednesday, September the 30th, and finally it feels like autumn has truly arrived. I hope you're able to enjoy this pretty cool weather that we're having now. We got out and walked and uh, just felt great this morning to feel something that wasn't 85 degrees outdoors. Um, just a quick word of, of update about a couple of things within the church. Uh, we have kicked off small groups, 242 groups, meeting this week. I uh, met with our group, Jackie and I did, on Monday night. Had a great time. Uh, if you haven't already connected with the group, I hope that you'll do so. You have uh, opportunities uh, still, even this week. You could come this evening at uh, 6 o'clock to the church and connect with the group that will be meeting there or jump in with us next week. And, uh, of course, as always, you have opportunities on Sunday morning at 845. Ken Quattlebaum leading a Bible study group in the Grace Room that's open to everyone and uh, other Opportunities like the men's Bible study on uh, Friday mornings at 8.30 for guys uh, meeting at Page and Pallet in downtown Fairhope, a ladies group that meets on Wednesday mornings at 10, and then our discovery group on uh, Monday evenings at 7 o'clock. So there's my commercial for opportunities for you to plug in. We've got a lot of different chances for you to plug into small groups. Hope you'll take advantage of that. I had an opportunity to talk um, yesterday, or I guess it was, yeah, yesterday, with uh, Pastor Isaiah about how things are going in Nigeria, and he was just ecstatic with uh, the progress that they're seeing. Uh, I'll share more about that with you on Sunday, but uh, just know that that God is just continuing to expand the influence of Freedom Church there in uh, Sapelo, that part of Nigeria, and the report is just so cool. I want to be able to tell you about some of the things that you have been able to do uh, through the church being created over there, just real practical needs that are being met and how the community is being impacted, but just be encouraged by what's happening there. We do have some specific needs within the church family right now, and uh, one of those is I, I know a lot of you are still dealing, dealing with hurricane uh, debris removal and recovery, and we've got several folks who are still at a place of need, a couple uh, specifically of our uh, single ladies who surely could use some additional help if any guys are available, just anybody is available that would be willing to be a part of a team to go over and help with some yard cleanup. If you would be able to do that, if you could just uh, reach out uh, to me or John or Brad and just let us know that you'd be willing to do that, we'll try and, and get some folks together to go in and knock that out in a morning or an afternoon. So just uh, shoot me a text or an email. You can reach uh, any of our leadership by just typing in uh, f- any of our first names uh, at freedomchurch.net. So Mark at freedomchurch.net, Brad, John, whoever at Freedom Church, at, excuse me, at myfreedomchurch.net will reach any of us by email. So we would appreciate your help there. We are still in the book of James. And so if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to James chapter 5. Uh, we're close to the end, but we're not going to wrap it up today because the last little portion of James is such a uh, just a dense and really Uh, important passage for us. And it's such a perfect lead in to this coming Sunday and the series that we're about to begin. On Sunday, I'm going to begin what's really going to be our spiritual growth track for the fall. We'll focus six weeks on a series that's entitled Learning to Pray. It's not going to be a guilt-ridden series. It's going to be, I think, a really liberating and helpful series that I hope is going to just help you to experience a total makeover in your prayer life. I'm excited about it, looking forward to it, and hope that you'll track with us through that, both in worship and in small groups. And this passage uh, today, and again next week from James 5, is a great lead-in to that. We pick up in verse 13, where James says this, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. That's a lot said in just a span of about three verses there. And I think if we're honest, I know it depends on what your background is as to how comfortable you are with some of the things that James has said here, but there's a part of what James has said that I'm sure makes all of us feel, you know, encouraged or hopeful. But I think if the truth be told, for a lot of us, some of what James has said here is really uncomfortable. Like if if somebody just said these words and they weren't reading them straight from the scripture, I think there are a lot of us who would want to go, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Now that's not how it really works. For instance, when James says the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. I, I've heard Christians from 
the circle that I've come from in, in my background who would be so quick to say, no, 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 it, it's not your prayers that make the difference. It's God who does it. Of course, it's God's power that, that heals, but it's so interesting that James says, but it is your prayer that is offered in faith that makes the difference. The prayer that's offered in faith will make the sick person well. And then there's that, that final line that we get so uncomfortable with where he says, and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, you're going to have to tune in next week for us to tackle that last line because it is so tied to the verse which immediately follows it. And so we'll we'll dive into unpacking that next week. And what we'll look at next week is really important, good stuff. But we'll just focus on these three verses today. He begins by saying, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Isn't it interesting how many times when we get into a difficult situation, when we've just exhausted all of our other resources, all of our other options, we'll find ourselves saying, well, there's nothing else we can do, so I guess we'll just pray. As if that's like the final Hail Mary when there's three seconds left on the clock and and your team is down and they're 50 yards from the goal line and, and there's so little hope, but we'll lob one up anyway just in case there might be a miracle for us to just pull it out here at the end. And that was never how God intended for prayer to be. From the the best moments in life to the most distressing moments in life, God wants us to live in just this constant flow of just an open dialogue with Him through the day. It doesn't mean that we that we go around with our heads down and, and disconnected from the world like a, a bunch of, of monks or, or nuns in a monastery or a convent just focused on nothing but talking to God. That's not the picture at all. It's it's one where whatever's going on through the day, if, if we're having a great day, a happy day, says, is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Let there just be rejoicing in your heart and just, just songs of, of thanksgiving and praise to God for his goodness and for his favor in your life. But if you're having a difficult day, if you're having a bad day, don't make prayer your last resort. Let prayer be your first response because prayer is not this this thing that we do that's such a long shot that's unlikely to yield any effect. What James is saying is you're reaching out to the God who first of all loves you more than you even love yourself and you're not trying to connect to a God who is so busy that you might or might not be able to get his attention. No, you're, you're talking to your father who is always super attentive to your needs and what's going on in your life and who delights in meeting your needs. So he says, hey, if you're in trouble, whether it's big or, or little, I mean, trouble might come in the form of, oh my goodness, I may have cancer. I'm afraid my marriage is about to end in divorce. I, I'm afraid my child may be hooked on drugs. We've just faced a gigantic financial crisis. What are we going to do? Trouble may come in those those kinds of big packages, but you know what? Trouble may be as small as I'm late for this appointment I, and, and I can't find a place to park and, and I can't afford to be late for this. Oh God, can you please help me find a parking place? How big or, or small the trouble may be, the good news is prayer isn't your last resort. God isn't your last resort. Prayer is the first thing that we as believers should turn to. God, could you help me with this? And we don't need to be embarrassed or ashamed about that. Like, you know, we've only got so much credit with God and we don't want to waste that on the little things. We better wait until it's something really big that, that we really can warrant asking for the attention of the God who has to watch over everything. We we need a bigger picture of who God is, that, that God isn't taxed by our prayers, that he so enjoys that we're just willing to interact with him throughout the day and talk to him about the good things and the difficult things and to just to make it just the natural language of our heart to go, oh God, could you help with this? God, thank you for that. Thanks for such a pretty day. Oh, it felt so good to be outside. Thank you, God, for just turning the thermostat down today and making it feel so good. He loves just this ongoing dialogue, and he isn't burdened by us repeatedly saying to him, God, I sure could use some help with this right now. In fact, I'll tell you, when I was in seminary, one of the most interesting classes that I ever took was a, a class on prayer where what the professor did was was really different from any other class that I ever took. The whole class was on prayer the entire semester, and so what he had us do was go through all of uh, the book of Psalms and every book of the New Testament 
And he just broke it up. It's a small class. He broke it up among us so that we all had a section of the Bible assigned to us. And every single verse that was anyone praying about anything, and of course that includes all of the 150 Psalms, but you'd be amazed when you go through the Scriptures how many prayers there are in the Bible. So we, we pulled out every prayer and every even just the smallest teaching on prayer. So the whole semester was spent unpacking all of these prayers, all these teachings on prayer. And so one of the things that you discover when you get every single prayer of the Bible laid in front of you is you sort of can begin to categorize what the different kinds of, of prayers are. Prayers of praise, prayers of thanksgiving, or of confession, or lament. But when you, you sort of put them in categories, one of the things that overwhelms you is if the prayers of the Bible are for us the model of how to pray, the lion's share, like if you put them in columns, all the different kinds of prayers, the really, really long list of the, the most frequent prayers in the Bible are prayers of petition where people are coming and saying, oh God, can you please help me with this? God, we need you to do this. And this is what God's given us as a model. And I don't know, I just found that really liberating because in my own prayer life, for the longest, I had this sense of like, oh, I really should spend more of my time just praising God, worshiping God, thanking God. And, and those are great things. We should do those things. But I just felt like, oh, I spend too much time asking God for things. He must be so bummed about hearing from me because I feel like I'm always asking him for so many things. Well, God isn't bothered by that. In fact, the lion's share of the prayers that we find in the Bible are prayers where people are asking for help. And so that's what James is saying. Hey, if, if you're in trouble... Pray, ask God for help. And then he gets specific about one of the ways that we do that. He says, Is anyone among you sick? Then let them call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. What's that all about? If you're sick, pray and even call for the elders of the church to anoint you with oil and to pray. Is that something that's still relevant for us today? Well, it absolutely is. It's something that we still practice today. Now, what James is saying here isn't setting a pattern that every time you get a sniffle or a sinus infection, oh my goodness, we've got to convene the elders of the church to pray over this. That's, that's not the point at all. Obviously, a little common sense applied would tell us that there are plenty of things that it's sufficient for us to just pray for ourselves or just to have our, our spouse or a friend or a family member agree with us in prayer, but that there are going to be times where sickness is so acute or it's so severe that we realize, boy, I need somebody standing in agreement with me in prayer, and this is significant enough that I feel like I need to call on the elders of the church to do that. What's that really about? I know that we... I think sometimes just at a simple level, want to just turn that into, oh, those are the big guns of the church. Those are the folks who really have the hotline to God. And so if we really need to make sure that a prayer gets through to God, we get the elders of the church to pray for us. And that is not what James is talking about. I'm an elder of the church, and I don't have any more of a direct access to God than you do. It's really interesting as a pastor how many times in ministry settings people will, will just make it clear in the things that they're saying that they don't really feel like their prayers are going to reach God or their prayers are going to, to be effective in, in tapping into to God's grace or power to bring about change. But if they could get a professional holy man to pray, then that would make it happen. That's not what James is teaching us here. I think there are a couple of things that he is trying to communicate. And, and one of those is that there are going to be situations sometimes that are, are so so difficult or so challenging that we're going to really need to borrow the faith of someone else to help us. You remember the father who, who brought his son first to the disciples and then ultimately they, they couldn't do anything to help this sick and afflicted son who was turns out was demon-possessed and his illness was a result of a demonic influence and the disciples couldn't do anything to help him. And Jesus is having a conversation with the Father. And in the course of that conversation, Jesus is trying to, to stir up and discern you know, the, the faith of this man. And in response, the Father says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Now, that, that's such a great line. To me, it's one of the, the most important lines for us to relate to in the Bible because it's where we find ourselves, at least in the, on the matter of prayer, we find ourselves there so much of the time. 
God, I do believe. I, I believe you're able. I believe you care. I believe you you love me. I believe you want what's best here. But there's still a part of me that's going, but I'm not sure at all that you're going to do anything. I'm not sure that my prayers are going to make any difference. I'm not sure that I'll ever see what I'm asking for happen. I, I believe, but boy, I need you to help my unbelief. Well, that's a legitimate prayer for us to pray. But one of the practical things that we can do to to help our own unbelief is to tap into somebody else who has a deep faith. The truth of the matter is, for all of us who are followers of Christ, it's much easier for us to believe God for God-sized answers and and God-sized solutions when it's your problem, when it's somebody else's problem. I, I don't have a difficult time most of the time believing God to come through and to demonstrate His power to to heal or provide or set free for you and your need. Do you know where it's most challenging for me? Is when it's me, when it's my family, when it's my body, when it's my issue. It's in those moments that I find that oftentimes my faith will, will get shakier and I'm, I'm in that place of, I do believe, but oh, I need help with my unbelief. And so we can borrow each other's faith in those moments. I ask you to pray for me, and suddenly, you know, you don't have a difficult time believing that God's going to come through in my life and meet my need, and I can do the same for you. And in that way, we draw from each other's strengths. Well, when we call on the elders of the church, that's exactly what we're doing. We know that we can have confidence that we're calling on faithful men who love and trust and follow the Lord. And we're, in in one way, we're borrowing their faith. We're letting their example and their prayers of faith stir up faith in us. And I've had that happen so many times in my life. Um, I'll tell you, I mean, there are a variety of people who have had this kind of impact on me, but one of the people who does that so well in my life is Pastor Isaiah Kadiri in Nigeria. He and I, in talking yesterday, we, we spent time praying together. And I love to pray with faith-filled people like him, especially when it's something big that I'm praying for, that I'm struggling to really, truly believe God for. And I'll ask somebody like him that I know is going to pray in faith, just praying with them and listening to the confidence as they call on God and they are declaring and believing the promises of God. It's like something just gets unleashed in my heart that suddenly I come out of that and I'm like, I believe God for that now. Now I'm praying in faith over that because I've connected with somebody who can pray for me in faith. And so when we call on the elders, that's a part of what's going on. But there's another piece to that that's really significant. It's so important to understand that in the kingdom of God, nearly everything happens along a line of authority. It's like a chain of command, if you think in terms of how things work within the military, whether you're the the lowest buck private or a sergeant or a second lieutenant or all the way up to a general or the commander-in-chief, there is this very clearly laid out chain of command. And the kingdom of God operates in much the same way. It's not about who's more important and who's least important, but for the military to function the way that it's supposed to, everyone has to stay in a place of submission to authority. Privates answer to corporals, corporals answer to sergeants, enlisted men at all levels answer to officers, second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain, major, lieutenant colonel, colonel general, right on up the land to the commander in chief. There's this clearly laid out chain of command, and it doesn't matter whether what your personality's like or, or so many other things. Consistently in that chain of command, a first lieutenant will always answer to anybody who's wearing a captain's bars or or the, the leaf of a, of a major because there is this clear order. Well, the kingdom of God is very orderly like that, and you can't step out of the chain of command. When we do that, it opens us up in many ways to attacks from the enemy. And so one of the things that this reference to calling for the elders of the church to pray for us, one of the things that that will ensure is that we are not in a position where we have stepped out of out from under the covering that God provides. Every one of us need people who provide a covering for us. I need that, you need that, and it comes at a variety of levels. Within the family, God provides those coverings for children. They have a mother, they have a father who provide a covering for them, husbands and wives. The husband provides a covering for the wife. Within the family of God, we have 
pastors and elders who wind up providing a spiritual covering in this this chain of command in the kingdom of God. And so one of the things that happens when when we reach out to an elder to say, would you pray for me? Would you pray for this sickness? Would you pray for this need in my life? It ensures that we are stepping in that and that we are living in that that position of surrender to God that gets expressed in rightly being related to the people around us. There are way too many cowboy Christians in the American uh, church today. And when I say the American church, I just mean the American expression of Christianity today where there are so many people who profess faith in Christ and they have no connection to a local fellowship. And that's a dangerous place to be because if you're not in a in a Christian church, if you're not connected to a local fellowship where you have brothers and sisters around you and where you have people in places of spiritual authority over you, who's that covering for you? How are you in that that line of command? And so it's important for us to make sure that we are rightly related to God himself, but to the people of God and to a local fellowship. And this is a practical way to do that. And there are many instances in the scriptures where sickness... By no means is this always the case, but but where a sickness is a manifestation of a demonic attack. We shouldn't just assume that that's the case, but where there is a lingering illness or something that just seems peculiar, you always need to be open to the possibility that this could be an illness that was either brought on or exacerbated by a demonic influence. I could give you multiple instances from the Gospels where this was the case and where a demonic spirit had to be dealt with in order for the illness or, or disability or pain or whatever to be removed. And so one of the most effective things that we can do in dealing with a demonic influence is to make sure that we are in line with the spiritual chain of command and to have someone who is an authority over us who provides a covering for us to pray in agreement with us. When there's a real difficult stronghold that needs to be broken and we're feeling challenged to deal deal with that at a personal level, it's such a a big deal for a parent to stand in agreement with a child, a husband with a wife, or any member of of a local fellowship to stand in agreement with their small group leader or with their elders or their pastors so that standing together in this position of of submission and agreement, boy, there is just power that is unleashed in that. And so in the heavenlies, there are things that are happening at a different level when we stand in agreement like this. So we shouldn't be hesitant or or feel weird about calling on the elders in these kinds of situations to say, hey, would, would you help us? Would you stand with us? Would you pray over us? And the whole thing of anointing with oil, it was considered a medicinal practice in ancient, ancient times. But it was also a symbolic thing that the the anointing with oil was always a picture representing the outpouring of God's spirit and God's power on a life. And so we still do the physical act of anointing the head with oil. We just take a little bit of olive oil and, and just make the sign of the cross on a person's forehead whenever we lay hands on them and pray for them. And what we are saying in that is we are asking for a fresh outpouring of God's Spirit and God's power. We don't put any confidence in our flesh. We are trusting in the power of God's Spirit now to touch this life and to provide what's needed. And so we we follow this practice and we believe the promise here that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And that's a promise not just for the elders of the church. That's a promise for every follower of Jesus. We need to lay hold of this. We need to reclaim this, that when we pray in faith, God isn't doing an evaluation in that moment of, well, how much time have you spent in your quiet times this week? How much money have you given? How many hours have you been in church this month? God isn't going through a spiritual checklist. God is listening to his child whom he loves just simply make a request in faith. You are my father. You are good. I'm asking you to come through and do this. And I'm trusting you to do that. And James says, when you do that, expect the power of God to show up. Expect change. Expect healing. Expect results. We should get back to the basics of believing that Jesus has given us authority so that when we come and we pray in his name, it is the same as if he showed up in the flesh and he is the one asking the Father for this thing. That's what it means to pray in faith in Jesus' name. And James says when that happens, the sick person gets well. The Lord will raise them up. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you have that right, you have that privilege, and you have that authority So exercise it. Walk in that and rediscover 
the joy of sharing each day with the Lord and the joy of accessing the power of God when you pray. Well, it would be silly to talk about prayer and us not take time to do it. So before we go, why don't we pause and pray together now? Lord Jesus, you are so good. We trust you. We thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that you are committed to moving us forward and growing us up. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that in the coming weeks that you would just take us into the school of prayer with you. I pray that you would just give many of us just a do-over, a makeover when it comes to prayer. And I pray that the result would be that we would discover again the joy of being with you, talking to you, hearing you speak to us in fresh ways, and walking in faith as a result of that. Thank you that you're always attentive to what we say. Thank you that when we pray in faith, you show up, you pour out power, you make provision. And I pray that you would stir up a new level of faith in us to believe you to do the impossible when we pray. I want to invite you as we're in prayer right now, just take a moment and whatever need, struggle, or issue that you're feeling right now that's just been weighing on you and maybe you've been struggling to believe God for that, would you just take a moment to just put that before the Lord and to ask Him to come through? Be specific in, in just telling Him what you need and just in a simple prayer of faith, would you say, Oh God, would you touch this life? Would you meet this need? Would you heal this sickness? Holy Spirit, would you do what you alone can do? Would you birth faith in hearts that have struggled at times to believe where our faith has been shaky? Help our unbelief. God, would you once again today demonstrate your power to save, to heal, to deliver, to restore, and bring glory to your name in the process. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for connecting us and letting us belong to your family. Thank you for Freedom Church. We look forward to what you're going to do as we gather again for worship on Sunday in Nigeria and here on the Eastern Shore. Make your yourself known. Bring glory to yourself by your work in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in. You have a great second half of the week, and I will look forward to us being together on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Take care.